Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're so glad to see the turnout for today's event. Um, today is the first event in our speaker series um, for fall 2020 with the Urgent Challenges Collective. Uh, my name is Kate DeConnick. I teach in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of San Diego. And along with Dr. Mike Williams, who's with us today as well, I'm one of the co-directors of the Urgent Challenges Collective. Um, if you haven't heard about the collective before, it's an initiative at USD that supports research, teaching, and advocacy and engagement that's centered around addressing homelessness here in San Diego. So our fall 2020 speaker series is really geared toward inviting local experts and people who are doing work on the ground um, that centers around homelessness to kind of share with the local community, um, you know, students, faculty, but also community members from San Diego, um, just some of the insights that they've gained from their work. Um, so today is the first part of the speaker series. Um, we're thrilled to see the turnout. We'll also share the link with you if you're interested in learning more about our other events um, so you can see what else is on the horizon. Um, in just a second, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Williams, who's going to introduce our speakers for today. We have two wonderful speakers for our event on covering homelessness. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to share a little bit about kind of Zoom etiquette and teach you how to navigate some of the stuff that's going on in our Zoom session for today. Um, we have a pretty large group for today, um, and I think there are some folks who are going to be joining us later as well. So just as um, a form of courtesy, we ask that you keep your audio muted in order to minimize any background noise, especially while the presenters are speaking. Um, if it's possible for you to also mute your camera just for the time being, that would be really helpful. Um, sometimes with a lot of people on Zoom, it can get a little bit overwhelmed and start making the video choppier. <laughs> so once we get into the Q&A time, if you'd like to turn on your camera, that's great. But for now, we'll ask that you please keep them off. Um, although we do miss seeing your beautiful faces. <laughs> um, after our presenters speak, we will also have time for questions and answers. And the way that we're going to do the questions and answers with our big group for today um, is we're going to share the link in the chat area of Zoom to a Google Doc. Um, so what you'll do if you want to access the Google Doc and type in any questions for the speakers, you can use the navigation panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen and just click on the link for chat. And that's where we're gonna drop the Google Doc. And you just put your questions right in the Google Doc. And that's how we'll kind of pick the questions um, for the moderated discussion for today. Um, if someone asks a question on the Google Doc that you also find very interesting or that you would also like to have answered, then you can just put a little asterisk next to that. And then we'll know that there's a lot of interest for that particular question, okay? Um, good, so I'll put that in the um, chat in just a second, but let me turn it over to Dr. Williams now, who's gonna introduce our two wonderful speakers. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Dr. DeConnick. We are thrilled to have both Lisa Halberstadt and Greg Angel with us here today. Uh, Lisa is a staff writer for The Voice of San Diego, where she's worked since 2012. She focuses on the city of San Diego and county government issues, and specifically homelessness and housing. Her coverage of these issues, and especially her coverage of the HEPA crisis in 2017, have been instrumental not only to inform the public, but to influence our local lawmakers. She's a graduate of Bowling Green University, where she majored in print journalism. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you for having me. And Greg is the CEO of Interfaith Community Services, a position he's held since 2014. Interfaith Community Services is one of the most active and important social service providers in the county for those experiencing homelessness. Uh, in his free time, I think, <laughs> Greg is the host <laughs> of the podcast, Homeless in San Diego, Real People, Real Stories, which is an incredibly important resource for our community as it not only informs residents about the issue of homelessness, but it's a platform for those experiencing homelessness to tell their own stories. Greg graduated from UC San Diego where he majored in political science. Um, he then came to USD and he earned a master's degree in leadership and nonprofit management. Greg, welcome. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. So let's turn it over to our two speakers. Um, Lisa and Greg, I don't know if one of you would prefer to go first or if you have a set plan for how you'd like to do things, but we'll give you the floor to kick things off for us. Yeah, we're going to have Greg kick it off since he goes back further than I do on this one, right, Greg? Yeah, we, we thought we'd start by talking about how we got into doing this. Um, my story starts right there at USD. I finished undergrad at UCSD. I was working at the Joan Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice there on campus, and I thought I was going to work internationally. I uh, was waiting for a Peace Corps application to get approved. Um, I wasn't very good with money, and I ran out of money. Uh, Budget was not my forte, 
I had to get a real job while I waited. And I heard about this group called Interfaith Community Services up here in Escondido. I came here, that was 2006. And my whole life changed when I came to realize just what a difference um, people working together could make in the lives of, um, uh, of local individuals and families facing really um, unbelievable challenges. And, um, and so I've been really working in North County ever since then, most of that time at Interfaith. And we do a lot of work around homelessness. Um, unfortunately, uh, homelessness has gotten worse in that time. And, uh, um, and I've had the opportunity to, um, to lead as our executive for, gosh, about six years now. And um, it's interesting that in the nonprofit sector, nonprofit organizations are um, incentivized to, to, to keep living and keep operating financially. Like everyone who has a job here is incentivized to keep the place going. And that doesn't always directly align with the mission to actually help people in need and ideally put ourselves out of business. And um, so I've really had the honor of working with a lot of dedicated professionals who get that and dedicated volunteers who understand our job is to help others. And if we happen to be employed while we do it, that's really a wonderful kind of side hustle. Um, and uh, I think that that ethos is important because it's what led to the creation of the podcast which isn't a podcast to pimp interfaith or to like promote a brand. Um, it's to say like, here, listen, there's a lot of things around homelessness, but what you're not hearing are people actually experiencing homelessness. And can we create a show that really promotes that? Um, and, uh, and I think we need to do a lot more of that within the community, really focusing on what is working to get people out of homelessness and prevent them from ever coming into homelessness and less about you know, the, the egos of who's doing it and which organization is doing it. So um, that's a little bit about kind of both how I got into this and kind of my perspective on what we need to do. Um, and uh, it's great to be here with Lisa because Lisa has had a, a huge impact in, in changing things from a very different role as a, as a reporter. Um, so Lisa, turn it over to you. Thanks, Greg. So yeah, I actually, um, I'm older than I look and I have been reporting now, it's been about 12 years professionally. And I've covered lots of different topics before I came to San Diego. I've written about everything from public safety to literally the ownership of an NHL team. I never thought I would write about homelessness, but the way it came about was in late 2015 or so. Um, and actually Kate, if you could pull up the PowerPoint um, for me and go to the slide with the homeless population. I think this is a good way to kind of explain how I got involved. Um, thought I would save you all from looking at my many, many tabs when I did that. Um, so if you look at, at the trajectory of homelessness, I made this quick chart um, just sort of showing what was happening with the homeless population. So around 2015, we were seeing that there was, you know, increasing homelessness. Um, and, and what I noted at the time, and my, my bosses, you know, really pushed, is there were lots of good groups like Greg's that were doing lots of work. They were having press conferences. They were talking about things that they were doing. But collectively, it was clear the numbers were going up. It, you know, and, and people wanted to know, what the heck are we doing about homelessness in San Diego? So I started writing about homelessness in late 2015. And as you can see, shortly thereafter, we got some point in time results in 2016 showing a pretty significant increase. Um, and at that time I started out, I was talking a lot to nonprofits. My beat was actually nonprofits and causes. Um, and around, right around like 2017, as the hepatitis A outbreak uh, was hitting, um, when you see that there was really a huge, pretty big increase in homelessness at that time. This was a very visible issue. Um, politicians were starting to get more pressure, but there wasn't a lot of action. And, you know, as I kind of I've reflected a little bit on this period too, as I, I think about, you know, in preparation for this talk, and, and what strikes me is at the time, there was a really different view about homelessness, especially um, with Mayor Kevin Faulkner. 
Um, he really wanted consensus on this issue that there are so many different you know, perspectives on. I know Greg gets caught up in that sometimes where everybody's got a different idea. Um, and, and what I did at that time is I know there were lots of folks um, who were homeless service providers, um, you know, working for different local agencies who were seeing that, wow, the numbers are really going up a lot. We're seeing a really visible increase in homelessness that's troubling a lot of residents, some who are more compassionate than others. And, and I was seeing and talking to a lot of homeless individuals that were suffering as were, you know, folks like Greg and, and his staff. Um, but it didn't seem like there was a lot of action. Well, then what happened is we had a health crisis that grew essentially out of our homelessness crisis. There was this outbreak, hepatitis A, um, which disproportionately impacted the homeless community because they did not have access to good sanitation, the ability to just quickly wash their hands after having a meal or before having a meal or using the restroom. And so what was happening is the city and the county were sort of doing some stuff um, and various cities around the county were doing some stuff related to working on this out outbreak and combating it. But the response didn't really match what I was seeing on the ground and what I was hearing in the numbers, just rising deaths. Um, and so what I did as a reporter is, uh, as reporters often do, is I just started asking a lot of questions and requesting data and emails. And I found that uh, basically the county had talked about deploying hand washing stations because, as I said, homeless individuals um, really don't have easy access to sanitation. And so I published a story basically saying two weeks after they talked about a pilot project where they wanted to put hand washing stations in areas where there were lots of homeless people, there were two stations that were up. And so I published that story in late August 2017, and there was a very dramatic reaction to that. Um, the city had kind of been saying, we're letting the county lead the way. The county had been sort of touting its efforts up to that point. And boom, a lot changed overnight. Um, the county actually sent a directive to the city the next day to take actions to put hand washing stations up. Um, later that evening, they actually issued an emergency declaration um, or within, I think it might have actually been the next day. And there was just a lot more dramatic action in the weeks that followed. Um, they not only put up hand washing stations, but across the county, there were additional restrooms opened and there was an effort to get out into the community and vaccinate people because with this uh, particular outbreak, there was a vaccine that people could benefit from to protect themselves. Um, and later there was actually, uh, there were shelters that were opened up in part because suddenly everybody realized, wow, we've got a real crisis on our hands. And later there was an audit that was produced at the state level, just laying out how there was sort of this sluggish response. Um, and I'll wrap it up because I'm talking a lot here, but I think, you know, what I've seen since then to kind of bring us to the next point of discussion is that people like Greg who work in nonprofits play a role in directly helping people on the ground. But journalists play a role sometimes in really taking a look at a trend, starting to dig in and understand it, and then being able to sometimes say the things that because folks like Greg, and I'm not picking specifically on Greg, but they want to keep their contracts that they have with the city and the county. And so they have to, you know, sort of color inside the lines. Whereas a journalist, I can say they were, you know, fumbling over this response and it was having real impacts for people's lives. And, um, you know, we can talk later about how the coronavirus has compared, but I think it, I thought it was useful maybe to provide you guys sort of a case study and that background of what happened with hepatitis A to sort of understand how the role of media can be different than the role that the nonprofit providers play. Well, it also, I mean, it also highlights the, the dynamics that lead to action or inaction. 
So I'm going to describe what Lisa just described in different terms. Um, homelessness has always been a problem. Uh, most people just haven't seen it. There were a lot more transitional housing shelters that kept people experiencing homelessness out of sight. And if you look at the chart that's up on your screen in 2016, those went away and the funding for those went to a different type of housing that really wasn't created as quickly as it needed to be permanent housing. And as a result, a lot more people who were homeless and in shelters went out into the streets. And all of a sudden, people saw, wow, there are always more, there are way more homeless people than there used to be. Not really, like, look at the chart. It didn't go up that much. Uh, it was just more visible. And then what happened? A disease that flourishes in third world countries hit San Diego because people were living on the streets and they had to poop and pee on the streets and then they couldn't wash their hands. And that spread the disease. And then people began to get scared that it was actually gonna affect them. And Lisa called out the county in particular, the city to a lesser extent, but in particular the county, whose response was crappy, called them out and, and put, put fire to their feet. And all of a sudden the political pressure happened and people started saying, listen, county, city, elected leaders, you have to solve this problem. We're gonna get sick. It wasn't, a, it wasn't by and large uh, an outpouring of love and compassion and care for people on the streets. It was a lot of people caring and being concerned about themselves and their own well-being. Um, and so uh, what happened is we had people in hazmat suits bleaching the streets of Escon or San Diego and Escondido. Uh, we had public health nurses out there vaccinating people. And, and, and it demonstrated what can happen when there's political will. Uh, philanthropists stepped forward to say, listen, we'll buy shelters, city of San Diego. You need to pay for the operations and put them up. And that happened. Um, and those shelters were zoned, whereas most of the time shelters are not allowed to, to be created in neighborhoods because neighbors don't want them there. The political will was there to make it happen in that instance. Um, so I just wanna be really clear we can do a lot of things in this, in, this, in this town of ours when the political will is there. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and that really drives a lot of what happens around, around homelessness. And, and Lisa, to her credit, was a huge part of creating that, that political will. And also, um, the, I believe what the county learned from their, their shortcomings in Hepe in 2017, they learned a lot that I think has much better positioned them to be um, effective today and this year in, in COVID. So um, that's had a, a real positive impact on that as well. Hey, can you go forward? Um, I think I have some photos so folks can see, and we'll talk about this number in a minute, but this is sort of what, and I should have thought to have this up before, this sort of shows you what homelessness was looking like um, to Greg's point you know, it was more visible than ever. And people were, especially if you were driving in downtown San Diego, people were shocked and would describe third world like conditions. And, you know, we got a third world like outbreak as a result of it. Let's go to the next slide real quick too. Yes, those are both on, somebody commented those are on 17th street. So then, you know, we were describing too, the hepatitis A response. You see the person getting vaccinated, the person in the hazmat suit spraying, um, and one of the bridge shelters downtown, which, you know, I haven't told this story too much. A lot of my friends have heard it, but it, I look at these, these photos and I kind of remember even in the months before this happened, um, having a conversation with the mayor of San Diego about how little they had gotten done. They were talking about adding shelters like this. And I remember, I still kind of, I still kind of can't believe I said this to him, but I, I basically said straight up to him at the end of a meeting, call me when you do something because you just keep telling me about these things that you're trying to do, but nothing's happening. And then boom, you know, suddenly the general population is scared and all these roadblocks were cleared that had existed before. So fast forward, let's, let's talk, Greg, a little bit more about what's happened um, during COVID. Maybe I'll give a quick overview and Greg has had way more direct involvement in this, but can we go to the next slide, Kate? Okay, so what was really interesting to me, and I actually wrote a story on this topic, maybe I'll share the link later, is there was a dramatically different response to coronavirus and the homeless population in San Diego than there had been years ago 
when hepatitis A hit. So where one of the big issues that I wrote about at the time of the hepatitis A outbreak was just this horrible coordination between the city and the county. I mean, it was just, they would send emails, it would take weeks to get back, and we're talking about people's lives and balance here when there's inaction. This time around, when even in the early days, going back to February, March, when, when you know health officials were really starting to realize that this was serious, the county called a series of meetings and also the Regional Task Force on the Homeless, which Greg has been really involved with, called a series of meetings to talk about what are we gonna do as a region? And there was a lot of discussion with federal officials as well, who had sort of weighed in when things didn't go great with um, the hepatitis A response. And so they mobilized pretty quickly to, you know, they realized that, wow, coronavirus could spread pretty dramatically and rampantly in shelters where people are very densely packed. You know, you can't really social di socially distance in, um, you know, a packed traditional homeless shelter. And so initially they moved folks out of shelters that were existing and tight. Uh, thank you for putting the link in there, Mike. Um, and first moved them to Golden Hall in the city of San Diego. And um, then they decided actually, and this was huge because there, this is just unheard of prior to coronavirus or, you know, if, and if five years ago you had said the city of San Diego is gonna put a homeless shelter in its convention center, no one would have believed you but they mobilized quickly to make that happen. And now about 1200 people sleep in that convention center every night. Um, and as you can see in the photo, there are efforts to try to keep the beds um, at least six feet apart for socially distant, social distance purposes. The county also went out, and this is the part where Greg has, can really provide a lot more context about how this has looked. But the county also realized wow, if there's a homeless individual, whether they're in a shelter or they're on the street and they come down with coronavirus, they don't have a place to isolate or quarantine. Um, and so the county went out and on the front end of the pandemic, so this is back in March, procured literally almost 2,000, I think it was ended up being in the end more than 2,000 at a different point hotel rooms. And they weren't just for people who are homeless and vulnerable, these hotel rooms were for anybody that needed a safe place to isolate, um, the majority of them. But then there were also hundreds of rooms, which Greg has been really involved with, that were specifically for homeless individuals who were considered very vulnerable. So they were seniors, um, maybe people with underlying conditions. And all of this would just have been unheard of years ago. There was a recognition early on, and I, I talked to county health officials, and you'll see you know, some of the quotes if you check out that story. There was a recognition early on that if this took hold, this coronavirus took hold in the homeless population, it could be devastating. And you know, to the broader community point, you know, as we've learned through both outbreaks, if one part of our population comes down with a horrible sickness that can spread rampantly, we are all vulnerable. Um, so it's not that this is all just a compassionate response, but I think that there is a greater political understanding. And Mayor Faulkner has even been uh, advocating at the state and national level for funding. Um, just yesterday, the city announced it's gotten some funds um, from the state to purchase a hotel. Um, these things are all unheard of years ago, but I'm going to have Greg talk about this from his vantage point. I've talked enough. <laughs> it's a good overview, Lisa. Um, it, we operated three hotel shelters, pop-up hotel shelters, one in Carlsbad, one in Oceanside, and one I'm here in Escondido at our headquarters. Um, and uh, we had uh, about 135 rooms at the peak. And we've sheltered more than 190 older adults or people with health conditions who are homeless, who, who should be sheltering in place, but don't have a home to shelter in. Um, one of the couples who we helped, uh, the, uh, the wife is 90 years old. Um, the husband is in his 80s. He's a, he's a veteran. Um, and we were able to um, help them get off the streets, get into a, a hotel room. 
and then um, uh, get them connected to healthcare. They hadn't seen a doctor in years, but when they were in a hotel room, which happens to be right next to our headquarters, and we have a health center here with doctors and medical services, we're able to get them connected there um, and then get them into uh, a housing unit that has an affordable rent and it also comes with supportive services. Both of these individuals have, um, have some, some ongoing needs that they need some help with. Um, homelessness may seem intractable, but it is solvable for every individual. I can tell you stories of individuals who you would never believe would be able to get off the streets and who you know, fit your, your stereotype of, of, a, of, a, of a crazy drug addicted person yelling to themselves and a threat to others on the streets with a shopping cart or whatever your people's stereotypical image is. I can tell you stories of that individual being successful in housing. And I can also tell you stories of what that li person's life was like when they were a manager at HR Block just um, 10 years ago, leaving a normal life with kids and you know, worrying about whatever the homeschool worries were at that time um, and how life suddenly changed for them. Um, and the horrible traumas they experienced on the streets that led to them getting to the place where you think they're crazy, drug addicted, whatever. Um, homelessness is solvable for every individual person. Um, it takes the resources though, and we don't have the resources. So thankfully, crazy as it sounds, coronavirus provided resources we haven't had before. These hotel shelters have made a big impact for a lot of the people we've been able to serve. Um, that being said, it's like the worst time to try to uh, to ramp up a shelter or anything around homelessness. Um, most people were at home sheltering in place. Our staff were here meeting a 400% increase in people who were turning to us for food and shelter and other household needs. Um, we rely upon volunteers, 90% of our volunteers older, they couldn't come in, they were at home. Um, our staff have health conditions, they couldn't come in. So, so we've actually had this like crazy dynamic of trying to scale up amid amid pandemic. Um, other providers are in the same boat. Um, a lot of resources get focused in the San Diego metro area. And so we've seen that at the convention center. Um, other areas of the county of our community are often afterthoughts. And so um, we have just as an example, 17 people in a hotel shelter right now, right next to where I am, they don't have a housing resource. Um, those housing resources are being provided to individuals in the in the convention center shelter, um, and um, and and I don't know where those 17 people are going to go when that hotel shelter um, wraps up, uh, which is scheduled to happen this fall. Um, uh, so yeah, everything around homelessness has certainly been impacted by the pandemic. We have a shelter here at our Escondido headquarters that normally houses 49 people. Due to social distancing, it's down to 25. So you're going to see capacity lower among shelters. That creates some challenges, um, and all the other challenges you might expect. Uh, so yeah, very very different world that we're in. I would say, I mean, just to kind of continue Greg's point too. I think um, those of us who work for nonprofits, I actually work for a nonprofit, but not a homeless serving one, um, and reporters like me are thinking about, okay, what happens when resources dry up or when eviction moratoriums end? So I'm sort of bracing myself right now. I'm extremely busy with a lot of other stories, but I'm sort of bracing for when all of these resources are pulled out from under people and what happens because I can tell you, and it just, you know, as Greg described early in the pandemic, um, he was seeing a huge influx of people. I was getting an influx of calls from people who didn't know where to turn for help. They were going to different resources and being told there's no room at the end. Um, so I think it's important for people to remember that, um, you know, many of us, you know, all of us probably on this Zoom, we have a safe place to stay. There are many people that don't, and to Greg's point, it is solvable um, if the community comes together, which I think, you know, both of these instances, we're still in the middle of one, but show that when you know, between hepatitis A and coronavirus, when the community comes together, it can do a lot of things. There just has to be political will. I wanna show one thing too, that I think is just a kind of grounding point. Uh, Kate, if you can go back to that number that we earlier here. Um, so to another thing to Greg's point about, you know, how, uh, you know, people don't realize how many people 
have experienced or do experience homelessness um, and how many people have come out of it that you might not, not even realize there may be people in your own life that have experienced homelessness who've not shared that with you previously. Um, but I find this number really grounding. So I, before we shared the number of, you know, the, the trajectory of the homeless point in time counts, which every year we have the big press conference about the point in time count. What I've had the opportunity to learn is that is just a point in time. Throughout the year, many more people become homeless and the Regional Task Force on the Homeless has been more focused on trying to gather data on this in recent years. And did you know last year, this number in front of us here, the 25,000 people accessed homeless services last year. So I think that that tells us something about the nature of homelessness. A lot more people uh, experience it. And some people experience it for a shorter period of time. And because of this pandemic, we could see, you know, I've heard some people describe it as a tsunami of people becoming newly homeless. Not all of those 25,000 people required a housing, like an actual apartment. Some of them just required a little bit of help. So I think as a community, because of what I expect us to experience, we may be hearing more about some of those different needs. Um, and certainly, I know, you know, Greg is, is mobilizing on his end to try to get more resources and journalists like me are trying to study this to understand what questions we need to be asking um, as things play out. Yeah, just to give another number, our agency alone, we serve primarily North, the North County, although we do work with people down in San Diego and at the convention center, but based on North County, us alone, we, we ended uh, uh, and prevented homelessness for 1400 people in the last 12 months. About half of those were homeless, so we moved into housing. About half of those were uh, about to be evicted, um, but we prevented from, from losing their home. And that's just one agency. Um, I, I, I want to highlight something and then maybe uh, Kate and Mike, we want to, and Lisa, maybe we want to do some Q&A, but uh, I just want to highlight who will become homeless as we see waves come in the future and who becomes homeless now. Um, on our podcast last February, we had a researcher from the Cal Policy Institute, Janie Roundtree on, and she has done some really groundbreaking research to try to predict who will become homeless. And what she did is she looked at um, 8 million records in the county of LA um, of, of about 2 million people, different databases, people were in different databases. Um, and she tried to come up with an algorithm to predict who would become homeless. And she, she got an algorithm that was 50% accurate within one year. So within one year, she could say 50% of these people are gonna become homeless. Um, and, uh, and so I asked her, I said, well, you know, what's like, what's the number one factor? What, what is going to predict if somebody becomes homeless? And I always ask this when I talk about this subject and ask, you know, what do you think it is? Um, you know, do you think it's mental health, addiction, income, uh, trauma? No, it is none of those things. It's the zip code you live in. It's the zip code you live in. And it's the economic depravity of the zip code you live in. People in poor communities, people in under-resourced, socioeconomically challenged communities are more likely to become homeless. And who lives in those communities? People of color. When you look at homelessness in San Diego, 28% of our homeless population are Black and African American. Less than 6% of our total population identify as Black or African American. It's skewed this way nationwide. We're even worse here in San Diego. Uh, and, it, and it is in large part a reflection. Homelessness is a reflection of society's problems. It is a reflection of the ways we are screwed up and we need to change. And so one of the reasons that I do what I do is because we can make a difference. We can end homelessness for every single person not at all at once, but one at a time, we really can. If we have the resources and if that individual, if we're able to connect with them and they're willing to, to move forward in the ways that, that, that need to happen, uh, we can do that. The other reason is that if we can solve this issue, we'll only be able to solve it systemically if we make progress systemically, whether it's, whether it's racial injustice, whether it's the, the class problems, I, there's so much more to it. It is a reflection of society's woes. So I think it is um, absolutely essential that we focus 
resources. And I am so, um, I'm optimistic that 42 people are here today to learn about this and dedicate themselves, you know, and, and, and be a part of what we're doing because you can make a difference and we really can um, change the world in very positive ways. Yeah, and I would just add as before we run into, you know, go into questions, which we're eager to take is I also, you know, enjoy covering this issue is, you know, it does definitely get depressing sometimes when you see the forgotten people that, you know, our society is essentially forgotten um, who, you know, have families and are worthwhile and sometimes really impressive in their own rights, but have fallen into homelessness. I am committed to covering this because I also believe that it's solvable. And, you know, I've seen in my work too, where there are, have been solutions for people. There was a woman I think about a lot as we talk about hepatitis A, who was really helpful to my coverage, who's now in housing. Um, she's permanently housed and, and thriving. Um, so this is solvable. Um, and it's important that, you know, folks who care about it, um, you know, stay plugged into the issues and, and get involved. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to questions. That's great. Is it okay, Lisa and Greg, if I take down the slides for now so we can kind of open it up for questions from here? Perfect. Great. Thank you so much, um, both of you, for this really rich fodder for conversation. Also, I mean, there's so many questions I think that people have about all of the points you're raising for us. Um, Mike, do you want to start with just picking off one of the questions from our shared Google Doc? If you came in late, um, we're using a Google Doc just to moderate the questions for today. I'm going to drop that link in the chat area again. So feel free to contribute any questions that you have there. Yeah, and I would just add, if you are a student, um, if you could put your, if you wouldn't mind putting your name next to your question, I think some of your professors are, are curious to see if you're engaging. So um there's a lot of great questions we'll start with this one um how do you how do you decide what language to use when discussing homelessness for example do you prefer to say persons experiencing homelessness or unsheltered individuals unhoused persons or something else i say i say people experiencing homelessness uh almost i try to do it entirely i've said a few different terms just on this call but usually people experiencing homelessness persons because uh, people need to be people. And uh, if, if you've listened to our podcast, Homeless in San Diego, uh, we ask our guests to share a call to action. And it's almost always to just simply treat somebody who you think may be experiencing homelessness, just treat them like a freaking person. Like don't treat them like an object, don't look past them, you know, just, just be, be kind and gentle and human to them. And so people experiencing homelessness, I find is the, the best term to support that. Yeah, I would say as a journalist, it gets a little bit more complicated because we have style guidelines and other things. So I will, I often say homeless San Diegans because I think that that reflects that these are San Diegans who are experiencing homelessness in a shorthand. Um, and I do push back and have sometimes when I see, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, people doing this sometimes in headlines, it's unavoidable or in, or in stories where folks will say the homeless, which takes the person entirely out of it. So I try to avoid that at all costs. Um, sometimes you'll see it pop up in a headline here and there, which is hard to avoid sometimes. Um, but I, you know, agree that it's important to, to remember that this is a person experiencing homelessness, it's not just the homeless. That's great. And thank you, Lisa, also just for highlighting the fact, um, this kind of misconception, I think, um, that Mike and I hear all the time in the work that we do that, um, you know, San Diego is a beautiful city, we have great weather, um, you know, this mentality of people move to San Diego kind of to be homeless here versus the reality being the fact that the vast majority of the people who find themselves unsheltered in San Diego are people who were already living here, um, some of whom were raised here and lived their whole lives here right before they encountered those circumstances. So the language of um, homeless San Diegans, I think, is really, you know, helpful maybe in that way. So thank you for that. Yeah, right. quickly, we have data from our North County shelters last place of residence and 80% uh, their last place of residence was in North County, not even you know, Arizona, we're talking North County specific. Uh, when you get to San Diego, it goes up to 90%. When you talk about the state of California, it's like 97%. So there, there are neighbors for sure. Absolutely.
great. Thank you both for that. Um, the next question, and just for the audience members, you know, we're looking for the stars also next to questions in the document. So that tells us that those are very popular questions that people want answered. Um, the next one that we wanted to ask from the audience was, um, can you talk a little bit about the relationships that you develop with those with whom you interview or interact? Um, so the unsheltered folks who you get to know, like what do your relationships look like with them um, through the work that you do? So one of the guests, I'll do, I'll, po I'll post the link, not the last podcast that we released, but before that, a gentleman named Michael Joseph overcame homelessness, um, came on the podcast. Uh, I met him in a park during World Prayer Day, because uh, we're interfaith for all these different clergy and people coming together. And he was there because he's a member of a faith community. And he's like, hey, I ended my homelessness in one of your housing programs. And so I connected with him as well. It's great to hear. Well, then we started a training program to train people who had experienced homelessness to be advocates and to speak in the community. Um, and he went through that training program. He spoke to the same philanthropists who I mentioned got the uh, bridge tent shelters going back in 2017, 2018. He spoke to that group uh, last or earlier this year. He's now volunteering for them to take meals out to people who aren't getting meals during this time of pandemic. Um, and he's, a, he's like a badass advocate. Um, and uh, that's just one example of, of like one relationship. Um, I'll share one more uh, sad uh, uh, story. And that is of somebody who um, was one of our early guests on the show and became uh, not only housed, but he came, became member of a local um, housing authority. Um, and, then, um, uh, and then ran into some trouble and ended up back in jail. Um, and is um, now um, out of jail and in one of our shelters. And we're trying to get him back into, into housing. And um, uh, having the personal connection with him, um, I'm able to be a point of reference and then connect him back to our teams to try to get him the support that he needs. So um, yeah, it's really, uh, you know, you, you build real bonds, right? As you would imagine, and Lisa, I'm sure you have similar similar bonds you've developed as well. Yeah, it's a little bit different as a reporter because we try to keep a certain level of distance. So I'm not necessarily somebody's friend, but we sort of have these relationships that span over time. So it's friendly sometimes. So there have been people that I have known for years, um, who some of whom I met when they were first on the street who now have had great success. Others that, you know, have been in and out of homelessness. Um, I think one of, you know, there are a couple of the stories, I guess, that stick out the most is um, there's a woman named Debbie Smith, who I met just before hepatitis A. Um, Debbie's in her 60s, tiny, tiny little woman, um, and but really feisty. And she kept me up to date on what was happening downtown during hepatitis A. She would tell me about what the police were doing when the bathrooms were closed. You know, and it was, she was immensely helpful to me. Um, and so every time somebody mentions my hepatitis A coverage, I always feel like, gosh, I wish I could have given Debbie a credit line um, for all of that because she was so helpful and connected me with a lot of people too. Um, today, she is in a senior apartment um, in Claremont. I haven't talked to her in quite a while, um, but I probably, I feel tempted now to check in with her and see how she's doing. Um, I've also had the opportunity, I think another group of people that I've gotten to know, some who've been more and less involved over time, is people that are involved with the homeless choir um, that has had great success on America's Got Talent recently. Um, I met a lot of these folks that are now in the choir on television when they were on the street. Um, and so it has just been so incredible to see their journeys. Some of the folks, um, actually, just before this, I had a call earlier with um, someone who's not involved in the choir anymore, but he's at the convention center now hoping to get housing. Um, so, I mean, we often catch up and talk and we get to know what's going on in each other's lives um, from social media and otherwise and message. Um, and it's, it's been an interesting experience. I think it really grounds me and reminds me constantly of the fact that you know, these folks are people, um, in many cases, very caring people who post on my wall for my birthday on Facebook, um, 
or you know, even this guy I spoke with, he said, well, wasn't it like last year you were out of town, your parents had their anniversary party <laughs> at this one location because he remembered because it was something familiar to him that I had posted. So um, a lot of very kind, special people that just happen to be experiencing homelessness or have experienced homelessness. Wow, thank you. That, those are some wonderful answers. Um, we have um, a lot of asterisks by a question. Um, for students, and they're asking, what are ways that they can become meaningfully involved in addressing this issue? And I would remind them that they can come to Dr. DeConnick and I at any point and talk about what we're doing on campus. But Greg and Lisa, maybe you have ideas of what they could be doing um, through your organizations or in the community. Yeah, I mean, get involved, volunteer, uh, you know, Every service provider relies upon volunteers. I think I see somebody from PATH maybe on the call here. Um, we uh, at Interfaith up in North County have a ton of volunteer opportunities. You can, um, you can even do some things virtually now. Uh, we do resume assistance to help people work on job uh, securing. We do some of that remotely. Um, but uh, yeah, get involved volunteering. Um, I mentioned we have a call to action on the podcast every single time people say, just be nice to people. So we can all do that, right? You see somebody who you think is experiencing homelessness, if you have a minute, stop um, and, and, uh, and, and ask them how they're doing. Just, just have a conversation. Don't, don't assume they're homeless, they may not be, but just have a, a dignified, respectful conversation that can make a huge difference. Um, our outreach teams work in communities throughout North County and um, the, the primary job is just to build relationships with people and to try to help them trust again. Because remember, every person who is homeless today, every single program has failed. Like nothing that Interfaith does has worked for them because they're homeless today. So the person has a really good reason to not believe you, to not trust you, to, um, to be scared of you. Uh, the traumas that people experience on the street are, are pretty uh, horrific. Um, so, you know, there's lots of reasons why um, they may be in that situation and not want to engage. So just being, being kind, offering a smile, it, 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 it'll go farther than you may think. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, you looked at me, you listened to me. That meant so much because a lot of people that experience homelessness feel like the world has forgotten them and so it's just so meaningful even just saying hi or genuinely you know asking how are you and really being interested can go a long way i would also add um that if you feel strongly about this issue and you have ideas or you just want your local government, state government, federal government to care more about this issue, advocate in that way, write letters, make public comments. Um, it's hard to believe sometimes, but pol local politicians in particular do listen. Um, if there are people in a neighborhood that are very concerned about homelessness, feel like there aren't solutions, your council members, county supervisors may be interested in hearing about that. Um, and I would also say if you care about, um, you know, coverage of these issues too, support organizations like Voice of San Diego, a nonprofit, KPBS does work on this issue as well. I knew Source has done some good stories. Gary Worth from the UT uh, covers this well too. Support those entities as well because I would actually tell you that years ago, it was kind of revolutionary when Voice said homelessness is a big part of my beat. That was a big decision. And so sometimes it's important to let our bosses know that that's meaningful to you as well. And sometimes that's not even with a, def, um, you know, a donation necessarily. Sometimes it's also just saying, I really appreciate that whether it's you politician or you news outlet are paying attention to this issue. I appreciate that. And, and I would just add demand housing, like demand that more housing be built. Homelessness is defined by one thing. It is a lack of housing. How people get there is different for every individual and it's different how they get out of it. But there's one thing in common, they don't have a home. So demand more housing, demand it of our elected leaders, demand it of um, uh, uh, 
of, of, of our elected leaders that they support that. And, and when the opportunity comes forward to create housing for people who are overcoming homelessness in your community, support it. Because there are a lot of people out there at city council meetings and at town halls saying lots of awful stuff. And, um, you know, the more voices speaking up uh, with voices of reason and compassion, uh, the better it will make a difference. Yeah, thank you for that, Greg. And I would just, um, if you go to our speaker series webpage, you'll see that we're having a discussion with Stephen Russell from San Diego Housing Federation about the housing bond, which is a way to get more funding for affordable housing. So thank you for raising that, Greg. And also thank you for all of you posting opportunities to get involved. Um, Kate and I are keeping track of those. We can look at this afterwards and we can provide those on our website for our students. So thank you. Um, we have another question um, that is asking, it's starting with the premise that there are often, um, San Diego the Police Department conducts sweeps of the streets before the point in time count. And the question is, um, what, can, what can be done um, to either stop that or to provide incentives where that does not happen as frequently? And Greg, I'm not sure if that happens as well in, in Escondido or not, but thank you. Everywhere. Um, it's a lot easier to arrest people than it is to build relationships and connect with the uh, resources to get people into housing. So, um, so yeah, it's a lot easier to just um, enforce your way out of a problem. Uh, it doesn't solve the problem, it just scatters uh, people. And it also prolongs people's homelessness when they cycle in and out of jail. Most people who are on the streets for a considerable amount of time have spent time in jail. Um, and uh, so, you know, one alternative is to uh, invest in homeless outreach teams that uh, either within police departments or in lieu of police departments or uh, in partnership with police departments to build those relationships. Um, and again, to, to demand of local police departments and local cities and county and governments that we do these things. Um, and, uh, and then also to have places for people to go. Shelter is one option, but not everyone wants to go to a shelter. Uh, and so we need more housing and that ultimately will allow for us to have less of a need for sweeps and enforcement. Uh, I, yeah, I, I've reported a lot on the sweeps and enforcement in particular in the city of San Diego and um, would say that my observation in, you know, interviewing people, looking at the data too, is that um, arrests, citations really impact people's ability to get off the street. Um, so I think I would kind of reiterate a point that I made before about uh, speaking up to your elected officials. One thing that I've observed is that police are often called, and this is something we're talking a lot about as, you know, a society right now from more of a racial lens. But, you know, I think from a socioeconomic lens, it's important to think about as well. A lot of times we call the police when we're not sure what else to do. And that's not always the most appropriate response, but it's the one that you can call right now and they're going to respond. And, you know, not everyone would necessarily agree all the time with why 911 is being called or was it necessary to call 911. Um, and so I think that there have been more voices speaking up about the need for more mental health clinicians to be available to respond instead of police officers um, to certain instances. And I want to also just emphasize that not every homeless person has a serious mental illness or even a mental illness. That's a misnomer, that myth that also often gets stated. Um, but, but I think, you know, if you care about seeing a reduction in police enforcement or sweeps affecting homeless people, whether it's before the point in time count or any time in the year, the thing to do is to tell your council member that you care about another resource being used. I know some council members in the city of San Diego have heard that, and they have instead um, invested in a homeless outreach person from PATH um, that's working in center city communities, and now they're wanting to expand that. Um, but it really comes down, though, to community feedback because for a, um, you know, it's really hard when you have a bunch of residents standing up and saying, we want the police to come and we want them to get these people out of our neighborhood. It, it's helpful for that politician to have some people on the other side to say, I don't want the police arresting these folks. That's not going to solve the problem. I'd like somebody to come out and help and see if these individuals could get some help. And I do think, you know, it will be interesting, particularly in our mayor's race in San Diego, to see where this practice goes. 
um, Assemblyman Todd Gloria, um, who used to be pretty involved with the Regional Task Force on the Homeless, which Greg is currently very involved with, he doesn't, he has said that he doesn't believe that sweeps and otherwise are the right approach. Um, Barbara Bree, a city councilwoman who's also running for mayor, has been a little less clear on, on where she stands on that issue. Uh, and that's something I'll continue to, to press her on. But when you have opportunities to ask your politicians about that, don't hesitate. I'm not the only one that can ask questions of politicians. It's residents' jobs, too, to ask questions. But then you also get the opportunity to say what you think that they should be doing. Wow. Well, um, this has been an amazing conversation. I can see that we're, we're right at time. Um, Kate, do we want to do the photo first or wrap up word first? What do we want to do? Yeah, we have a tradition that we like to do at the end of our Zoom events that we would invite any of you who are interested to participate in with us. Um, whereas a thanks to our speakers who normally we would applaud for, but that doesn't work very well on Zoom. Um, what we like to do is invite people just to turn off, turn on your cameras for a second. And if you wanna give a wave, we're gonna take a screenshot to share with them waving our thanks. So if you're game for that, feel free. If you prefer to remain anonymous and leave your camera off, that's totally fine too. But if you're game to give our speakers a thank you wave, let's do that together. Yay. Oh, that's super cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. okay. Great. Oh, yeah, this is wonderful. I got a great picture and I'll share it with them um, with our speakers for today. So thank you. And then Mike, did you want to just wrap up from here? Yeah, I just want to thank you again. I mean, uh, doing this on zoom is is different. But man, it went so well. And you, you helped us frame this issue um, in just the best way possible. And I what I really, really appreciate you both doing is encouraging our community to not only stay involved with volunteering, but to have their voices heard by political leaders. And in a time when there's a lot of issues kind of demanding attention and this November, that um, thank you for reminding them to get involved and to, to uh, let our political leaders know. So thank you for the work you're doing and thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> my email and cell phone in the text reach out to me anytime anything i can do to help love that you all care about this issue thank you kate and mike for your leadership and lisa uh has helped a, a ton of people through her reporting so it's fun doing this with you lisa thanks greg um and i also included my uh, email address as well if you have story ideas or you wonder how somebody uh feels about the issues i'll say uh, later, actually, it's going to be next month, Voice of San Diego will be hosting PolitiFest, and it will be a virtual event. Last year, we had it at USD. Uh, this year, obviously, it's a little complicated with coronavirus, so we're having it virtually. Um, and we'll be having a lot of debates um, and, and forums with candidates. And I'll be actually hosting a session about the affordable housing bond um, that was referenced earlier and that Steve Russell from the Housing Federation will be coming on uh, to talk about um, to your group. And then uh, also, um, I'm going to be moderating a debate between the two uh, District 3 City Council candidates, um, which is where, you know, the epicenter of homelessness in San Diego, and there will be other events too. But those events like that are opportunities as well to raise your voice and, um, you know, suggest questions or maybe even directly ask a question of a public official, even if it is on Zoom. So thank you guys also for having me. This is great. Wonderful. Well, we wish everyone a wonderful afternoon. Um, please do follow up. We'll send out a follow up email just sharing out some of the resources and some of the links that everyone's graciously shared today. But please reach out to Dr. Williams or myself anytime if you're interested in learning more about the work that we're doing on and off campus through the Urgent Challenges Collective. And we'll hope to see some of you at our future events this semester too. Thank you for a great first conversation. All right. Be well, everybody. <laughs>